morning, everyone. What a crowd. This is incredible. Good morning. So I'm so glad that Wade showed the video, because I've been curious whether you think, we talk about next plays a lot. Have you ever thought about doing voiceover work professionally? It's no, pretty good. No, I've not, thank you. No? It's not, uh, not come up very All right, well, you should think about it. Um, you have a, uh, uh, an incredible view of where the working world is going through the data that we see going through LinkedIn, through the meetings that you're having with CEOs, travels around the world. We've got a room full of talent professionals here, HR pros, and the jobs that they are hiring for, career ladders they're building, are for jobs that some studies say might not exist in 20 years. We're looking at like 47% of jobs possibly going away in the US because of automation, globalization. Do you think that companies are prepared? First of all, where do you stand on, on this question of whether these jobs are going away, whether automation is gonna change how we work? And do you think companies are prepared for it? So I definitely think automation is gonna change the way we work. I definitely think we're gonna see jobs displacement. I think the number of jobs displaced is certainly open to interpretation. World Economic Forum has projected that by 2020 we'll see a net displacement of roughly 5 million jobs, 7 million jobs lost, 2 million created by virtue of the introduction of advanced technologies. Uh, recently, CNBC conducted a survey of global CFOs. Uh, a significant percentage of them all believe that up to a quarter of their jobs could be impacted, displaced by new technologies over the uh, next uh, few years, foreseeable future. So this is not just a top-down theoretical exercise. It's also a bottoms-up uh, operation. I think people see the writing on the wall. I think increasingly it's absolutely critical uh, that companies are doing a few things. One, you know, there's a lot of interesting headlines these days about the rise of new technology, artificial intelligence, robot capabilities, drones. And it feels like every other day there's a new headline talking about how a factory will replace tens of thousands of workers or a major retailer will change the way they do warehousing. And yet, uh, I very rarely, if at all, see those same articles talk about what happens to the workers being displaced. The focus seems to be almost exclusively on the new technology as opposed to what's happening to those folks. And I think it's very, very important that we're shining a light equally as bright on the people being displaced, how their lives are being impacted, what skills they have, what skills they need, how they're being retrained, where the job opportunities exist. In the United States, we are seeing record levels of available jobs in this country. And there are still, while unemployment is structurally at a, a healthy place, uh, as traditionally measured, you know, under 5%, when you factor in the underemployed, uh, folks looking for full-time work but can only find temporary work. When you think about those only marginally attached to the workforce, they've been looking for so long they've dropped out, the number of folks that are looking for more employment dramatically outstrips the number of jobs that are available. And so you ask yourself, why is that the case? And we have a skills gap. And I know it's been subject to some debate historically, but it's very real. And I think the faster organizations can embrace new learning capabilities, regardless of whether it's LinkedIn's platform or another capability, it is so critical that organizations are embracing these new learning capabilities to provide always on learning, on-demand learning, just-in-time learning to their workforce and empower people to acquire the skills they need for the jobs that are and will be and not just the jobs that once were. Well, it sounds like then what you're talking about is training not just for, all right, you need to get trained because there's a job that you're about to be, that you're about to go fill, but you might not be here in three years. We're, this job might be eliminated. How do you give someone the skills they need to leave the company? Is that what you think the role of, of an HR talent organization is now? I think increasingly, you know, it's, it's a really difficult thing for a company, an employer, a hiring manager, a team leader to admit that someone on their team's not gonna be with them forever. I think we all wanna think that uh, folks are gonna stick with the organization for uh, certainly as long as the manager is gonna be around. Uh, Reid Hoffman, the, the founder of LinkedIn, uh, recently wrote a book called The Alliance and introduced a concept that I think made uh, you know, a number of folks uncomfortable, but it's, it's a, a new reality, which is that people are going to leave at some point. And the sooner hiring managers, the, the sooner the leader of an organization or a team has those honest conversations with people about what is it you want to accomplish? How long are you planning on sticking around? 
how do you see yourself at this company? How do you see yourself evolving? Uh, Reed, you know, used the expression, a tour of duty. And he and I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I'm of the mindset that the longer we can keep people in seat, the more value we can create. The more trust that's built, the more shorthand is created. And it just creates far greater efficiency and effectiveness, in my opinion, amongst teams. You look at some of the most valuable companies in the world and the, the median tenure of their senior leadership is almost always north of 10 years. These are people who've worked together for a really long time. So that's my, my natural inclination is to want to keep teams together. Reed's argument is that uh, in the modern age, people are going to be rotating. They're going to be moving on. And he, he talks about the tour of duty. There's essentially three tours of duty, though. There's not just one tour of duty. It doesn't have to be just for two years. There's this rotational tour where a junior analyst comes in, and it's a program. And after, say, two years are up, they think about their next gig, either at your company or somewhere else. You see that in investment banking or consulting. There's the transformational tour, where someone joins the company who's got a longer term ambition that may not be consistent with the role they're taking, but you have an honest conversation about that. You recognize the fact that you can better prepare them for that longer term career objective. And maybe at the end of two or four years, uh, they're closer to obtaining that. And they decide to stick around for another tour of duty that brings them even closer to what it is they ultimately want to do. And that can be repeated. And then the, the third tour of duty is the, the foundational tour of duty, and it's a play on words. It's when you are hiring someone whose longer term objectives, whose own personal mission is so closely aligned with the company, they can't see themselves doing anything else. And the reason it's a play on words is folks like that not only comprise the foundation of a company, but as Reed likes to say, companies have multiple founding moments. And these are folks who almost think of the organization as their own, as if they helped to found it. And when you can establish that kind of bond, obviously it's very valuable. And recognizing, understanding, proactively talking about which tour somebody is thinking about uh, can really make a huge difference in terms of retention, engagement, and managing expectations in both directions. Do you, do you manage that way? I mean, you've got a, you have the people who report to you, skip level team. Do you look at them and say, two years, three years, foundational? I, I don't. I don't talk about uh, you know, finite time periods. We do talk about expectations in terms of project initiatives. The very first question, however, I ask during the recruiting process is, what's the ultimate dream? What is it you ultimately want to accomplish? You know, looking forward 20, 30, 40 years, looking back on your career, what do you want to say you were able to do? And is this role that you're interviewing for at LinkedIn going to bring you closer into alignment with that opportunity? And that is maintained, that kind of dialogue is maintained throughout the tenure of my relationship with that person. If they end up joining the team, it is absolutely critical that at LinkedIn we understand what somebody ultimately wants to accomplish and ensure we're doing everything we can to put them on a path to make it happen. I can tell you that when you interviewed me five years ago, you asked that question and it threw me off so badly because I was used to applying for jobs and saying, I'm going to work there forever. And to suddenly have the CEO saying, what are you going to do next? I haven't even started yet. What do you mean? What am I going to do next? Um, will you talk a little bit about the way that you approach social media? You are a incredibly, um, uh, you, you, you harness the powers of any platform in a way that I think a lot of CEOs don't. You're writing, you're sharing, you post pictures, uh, you comment. How do you think about your social media presence? And what kind of questions do you get from CEOs who are either want to do it or wonder why you, you, how, how you are so out there. It's interesting when you said, how do I think about my social media presence? I guess part of the answer is I don't. Uh -huh. I don't think about my social media presence, and I think that's in part where some folks, especially senior executives, uh, make a mistake. They think about their presence as opposed to authentically communicating the things that they're most interested in, the things that they're most passionate about, the things that are inspiring to them, things that they've learned or experienced that they think other people can benefit from. And I think that's where it all begins. It's, it's one word, and that's authenticity. I remember uh, sitting down with the CEO of one of the largest healthcare providers in the country. And he was flanked by his head of marketing at an outside agency. And he was saying, help me generate more engagement, because I see these other CEOs on LinkedIn, and they get so many more views and comments and likes and shares. And I told our team, why isn't that happening with my contributions? And I said, let me guess who's writing your posts. Would it happen to be one of the people on either side of you? He was smiling, and they were smiling. I said, that's part of the issue. Not that they're not talented and very capable, 
these posts have to come from you if you're going to generate engagement. And he said, well, how do you figure out what you're going to write about? And I said, I write about the stuff I care about. I said, so for example, you know, can you share a story that heavily influenced your career path or the way you think about the world or the values you use to run your company? And he told this incredibly inspiring story about uh, a specific healthcare crisis in the country and how that impacted him and it made an indelible mark and it forever changed his worldview. And as he was explaining this, he wasn't thinking about his social media presence. He was talking about one of the most impactful things that he'd ever experienced. And folk, this is why he's a CEO, he was really inspiring. And we were all kind of getting the chills and, and people were really inspired by this. And I said, that's it. He said, what's it? And I said, what you just said and how you said it, you manifest that, you channel that into your post and the engagement will take care of itself. And sure enough, he ended up writing a post very similarly to what he had expressed that day and it, it blew the roof off the numbers. Uh, so it's, it comes down to authenticity and talking about the things that you care about. When individuals and companies, and this is important for the folks here today, uh, because social media has become increasingly essential in how you build your talent brand and how you build your own recruiting practice. And the more you are just sharing talking points that have been pushed to you tops down from the organization, and the less authentic that comes across, the less value is being created. The less value is being created for your talent brand, for your company, and for yourself as a recruiter or hiring manager. It's when you take whatever guidance you've been given, whatever the company's about, the mission, the vision, the strategic objectives, the culture, the values, the things you care most about, when you authentically and genuinely care about that and express that in your own way, in your own style, and in your own voice, that's when people are going to pay attention. That's when you are going to meaningfully start to build a talent brand and your own practice. And it holds for anyone in any functional area. The more authentic you can be, the more effective you're going to be. And how do you draw the line? You are putting yourself out there. You're making yourself open to people. You are giving your voice in an authentic way. But you have people commenting, sharing. They feel like they're connecting with you. At what point do you say, I'm done? You know, I've, given, I've said what I need to say. How, much, how do you think about how much you're going to engage? That's a great question. You kind of, there's, there's no, certainly no algorithm or cookie cutter response. That is for, for sure. You just kind of feel your way. Mike Gamson, our, our head of uh, global solutions, uh, who many of you in the audience uh, probably know or have met, he wrote a, a wonderful post on the subject of uh, how to get started. And he essentially used the, uh, the analog, the metaphor of uh, going into a pool of, of very cold water. And if you dip your toe in, you're gonna feel how cold it is. You're gonna be like, there's no way I'm going in that pool. That water is frigid. Whereas if you just dive in, it's cold for a little while, and then you adjust, and then you're fine. Then you're making fun of the people who don't come in for being wimpy about it. And I remember when I first got started, I was not comfortable, like many folks. What do I say? How do I say it? How often should I say it? Are there lines I'm gonna be crossing? And eventually, I just kind of took the plunge. <laughs> Apropos, no pun intended. I took the plunge, and you learn as you go. Mm -hmm. You're gonna make mistakes, trust me. You're, you're gonna talk about things you wished you hadn't. You're gonna engage one too many times. Uh, you're gonna say things you wish you could walk back. But you're also going to experience these moments where you are able to help other people. You're able to share things that you've experienced through your own unique perspective or lens. And people are gonna express gratitude in ways you could never have fathomed had you not done this. You're gonna connect with people you never would have connected with. And it's, it's enormously powerful stuff when it's done properly. Uh, speaking of, of changing the way you communicate and, and the power of it, one of the big changes we've seen in companies this year, this is starting off small, is the uh, willingness of companies to talk about race internally um, and divisions within the company. And you've seen Goldman Sachs, uh, the, the head of HR at Goldman, just wrote a really interesting post where she talked about why Goldman wants bankers, tech leaders, talking about the questions of, of race and how people are separated. Um, at LinkedIn, there was a big town hall, a company-wide town hall, to talk about this, this issue. Um, and you were a major part of that. I'd love to hear how you think about the question of, should companies be discussing uh, the question of race inside, of, of what's going on in the world beyond just how we work. 
So the, the key word for me in your question is discussing. And it sounds like such a simple thing, but it's so critical. So Pat Waters, our head of talent, uh, has established one of our most important priorities uh, for talent across LinkedIn on a global basis as not only focusing on diversity and inclusion, but also belonging. And for us, when we think about diversity, we think about ensuring that our employee base is representative of the members and customers that we serve, making sure we have diverse perspectives around the table, making sure that we're thinking about diversity and representation as early on as recruiting and then throughout somebody's tenure at LinkedIn. Inclusion is ensuring that once those people are at LinkedIn, once they've been hired, once they've joined the company, that they're included. For example, they're invited to the meeting, that they're around the table. Because if they're at your company, but they're not in a position to share their perspective, what value does that bring? It's, it's just numbers. It's just checking boxes. Right. But diversity and inclusion are not enough. And we all have a long way to go along just those two dimensions. So it's challenging to introduce yet a third component to this, but that third component is so important. If you're gonna to go to the trouble of focusing on greater diversity, and you're gonna to go to the trouble of ensuring that those folks are included, it's critical that they feel like they belong. And so using the same meeting metaphor, diversity ensures you have people at the company who can attend the meeting. Inclusion is about making sure that they're around the table belonging it's about ensuring that the folks who are sitting around that table feel like they belong there. And I oftentimes use introversion and extroversion because it's a little less uh, fragile in terms of uh, people's ability to talk about it publicly. And when it comes to introversion and extroversion, I know uh, when I'm sitting around a table, I have a tendency to call on people or to interface and interact with people who are more extroverted, who are making their voices heard around that table. And yet there are introverts who are not comfortable doing that. And if a bunch of extroverts are going at it and you ask that introvert in a quiet moment, how did that make you feel? They're gonna tell you they didn't feel like they belonged and they're gonna tell you they didn't feel comfortable. So yes, you have a diversity of extroverts and introverts there and they've been quote unquote included, they're at the table. But if one of those cohorts doesn't feel like they belong, they may as well not be there. And so going out of your way to recognize that those folks think differently and calling on them, preventing other people from talking over them, that's what creates a sense of belonging. Now apply that same thing to gender, apply that same thing to ethnicity, and you know, it's a much more sensitive thing but it is absolutely imperative. And you asked me, what do I believe the company's role, the organization's role is in the discussion of that subject? And you know, it comes back to the publishing platform again, but I read a post on LinkedIn, I wasn't expecting it, I think the editorial team actually featured it. And it was from a woman, and she was talking about, she was a manager, and this, is, uh, this was shortly after uh, the Dallas shootings. And she was talking about the importance of having a conversation uh, with an employee on her team. And uh, the employee was black, the, the manager was white. And just by virtue of the manager asking how her employee was doing, it changed everything between the two of them. And oftentimes, if you don't know what to say in those situations, and I think if we were to do a quick poll of the audience, there'd be folks, if they were being honest, that they didn't know what to say or didn't know what to do when they came back into the office following those shootings and how uncomfortable it made everybody and whether or not you should say something and if you say something, are you shining too much of a light on the subject and is that gonna make people uncomfortable? Is it gonna make the situation worse? And it turns out, just by virtue of asking, how are you doing? Are you okay? Is there anything you wanna talk about? It just changes everything. What you don't realize, and it's certainly unintentional more often than not, is by not saying something because you're uncomfortable, you send the signal inadvertently that you don't care or that you're not thinking on behalf of that other person. You're not being compassionate. So I know that that town hall was a more formal and organized way 
of asking folks how they were doing, and sharing our experiences, and creating a safe place for people to talk about what was going on, and for some of our black employees to share their own experiences and things that some of their white colleagues could never have felt themselves because they've never been on the receiving end of that kind of treatment or behavior. And for folks that aren't black to share about why they're uncomfortable in those moments and not knowing what to say. And it just, it was, it was extraordinary. It was one of those unforgettable experiences at LinkedIn that all of us in attendance had and will never forget. And it's, it's something that I can't stress enough. Sometimes it just starts with a discussion. Um, <clears throat> one of the massive changes to LinkedIn this year has obviously been the purchase of LinkedIn by Microsoft. When the deal was announced, you wrote a post and you talked about the, the number of different areas, how this is going to, how you see LinkedIn growing within the Microsoft world. One of the things you mentioned was that this is that human capital uh, was an area that Microsoft hadn't really been involved with before. You've been in many discussions with Microsoft since then. You're talking all the time. What's, what, how is Microsoft starting to think, and I don't know how much you can get into this, but how, is, how much is Microsoft starting to think about this area of, of, of human capital, of, of, the, of what this market looks like? Um, what kind of questions are they asking to understand what, they've, what they're about to get into? Yeah, at a high level, uh, Microsoft has developed a platform called Dynamics. And I think a lot of people equate Dynamics with a CRM solution, a business application, but Dynamics is actually the platform supporting a business application that can yield a CRM solution or an HCM solution, an ERP solution, uh, customized business apps, analytics, workflows. And so uh, with the combination of Microsoft and LinkedIn and our professional graph, and the connections between people and this vibrant identity ecosystem, there is a lot we could do together in terms of leveraging this Dynamics platform to create value and provide additional alternatives in the market, highly competitive market, uh, for human capital management. So you think about what we're capable of doing in terms of finding the right prospects, and then uh, we're Microsoft to invest in human capital management, there would be some really interesting opportunities uh, for integration that would make uh, certain workflows and certain processes uh, far more intuitive, far more seamless. And it's not just about the application and platform layer, it's also about the advanced technologies underlying these capabilities. So Microsoft has made an enormous investment in artificial intelligence and has achieved critical mass in artificial intelligence. They have made an enormous investment in conversational computing and bot capabilities, natural language processing. And so you start to bring to bear uh, some of those capabilities, augmented reality is another example, uh, into the realm of human capital management, leveraging our graph, leveraging the relationships on LinkedIn, uh, leveraging what we understand about our members and Microsoft's customers, and it's exciting to think about the possibilities. You've been a CEO, the CEO of LinkedIn since 2008. You're now, you've had a board, but you've never, you haven't reported anyone. Mm -hmm. You talked about the idea of LinkedIn staying separate. How separate is it going to be? What is it going to be like for you having a manager again? <laughs> well, you make that sound so appetizing. Dave. <laughs> well, uh, Satya and I uh, first sat down to talk about this uh, in February of this year. And when we got together, we both agreed that uh, to take the discussions to the next level, we needed to ensure we had alignment on at least two things. One was purpose and the other was structure. And Wade presented earlier the similarity uh, in the mission statements between the two companies. And I didn't, I didn't realize that uh, once Satya had become CEO, they had actually codified a new mission statement at Microsoft, which you heard earlier, to empower every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more. And it's essentially identical to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful in terms of what we're trying to accomplish for members and customers. We go about it in different ways. Microsoft historically through software and increasingly now through the cloud, LinkedIn through a network. And while we've gone to edit from a uh, different place tactically, we're trying to accomplish the same thing. And in combination, may be able to accelerate our ability to realize those mission statements. What was interesting to me was not only how similar the missions were, but how purpose-driven Satya is. And it's something that's very, very important to him. And he believes is one of the intangible benefits of acquiring LinkedIn, knowing how purpose-driven we are. 
and uh, it's something that he wants to manifest to an even greater extent at Microsoft. So on that front, a lot of alignment, and it was a very pleasant surprise. When we turned towards structure and organizational structure, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if Satya was going to propose a full-blown integration and moving up to Seattle. I had no idea. And he said, I've been giving this a lot of thought, and I think LinkedIn needs to remain independent. And that uh, was not what I was expecting. He said, you're going to continue to be the CEO. And as we continued to talk about it, I realized how much thought he had given this. And he was talking about the models of, say, Facebook, for example, with uh, Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus Rift and the success that Google has had with YouTube, where all of these entities remained almost entirely independent and have had extraordinary success at scaling, continuing to grow, continuing to add value. And that was what he had envisioned for this combination. And I, I can tell you, uh, he meant every word of it. It's one thing to talk about that kind of thing when you're in the throes of a discussion and there's multiple bidders and so forth and so on. It's quite another once you've announced and you see that uh, he meant every word. Satya is uh, one of the most genuine uh, executives and leaders I've had the pleasure of working with. When he says something, he means it. And he has been consistent throughout. He's been cascading it at every turn to the LinkedIn team, to the Microsoft team, but he means it. And, you know, when asked about how he sees LinkedIn creating value for Microsoft, he said it starts with Microsoft's ability to help accelerate the realization of LinkedIn's mission and vision and to help us grow, to help us create more value for our members, more value for our customers. And the more we create value, the more he recognizes Microsoft, in theory, can create value because Microsoft can leverage some of these assets to create more relevancy, more personalization, more differentiation in an already highly competitive enterprise world. And so he's been, he's been, He's been great about that stuff. Um, <clears throat> we have time for just a, a couple more questions. One of the, the, the big areas for growth is LinkedIn learning, is the, is the entire learning space. How big, when we, we talk a lot about the idea of learning as something that employees need, you get to the next level. Um, when you look at learning, do you think it's bigger than that? Do you see this as being a disruptor to colleges? Do you see this as changing the way we learn from you know, K through 12 on? Or, or do you think about the role of LinkedIn and learning as being the place for professionals to get certain skills that they need to get to the next level? I think it starts with the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta start somewhere, and the more focused we can be, the more likely we will be to create value for folks and, and to be successful here. And this idea that we can take learning and development materials, whether those are created by Linda and this world-class team at Linda, highest NPS score we have in, in the entire LinkedIn portfolio is uh, Linda's product and services, which most people don't realize. Uh, it's in the 70s, an NPS score in the 70s. By combining that content with our social fabric, uh, with the metadata flowing through LinkedIn, so that you can understand the skills you need, uh, the skills that are growing the fastest, the jobs that are growing the fastest, your colleagues who are picking up new skills, uh, what folks within your organization are suggesting you need to learn and people like you need to learn by bringing some of that into the feed where people are already engaged rather than trying to expect people to go to some learning and development portal that as much as the L&D folks would like people to frequent, it's harder to get them to, to visit. For all these reasons, we think our solution uh, can really start to change the game. When you factor in the ability of taking the newly acquired skills and the newly acquired certifications, seamlessly integrating those into the LinkedIn profile, making those fields available for recruiters and hiring managers to search against, you're starting to talk about a pretty powerful and vibrant ecosystem. Where it really begins to fundamentally change, though, is less about the technology and, in my opinion, more about society. And we have some cultural norms here that uh, certainly need to evolve. We still place far too high a premium on prestigious diplomas from four-year universities. And obviously, those are of value. But there are so many other ways for people to acquire skills, especially the skills they need to be successful in this day and age, that go above and beyond that. And all too often, people have a tendency to just gravitate towards those traditional prestigious diplomas and degrees. And when we can accelerate the pace of hiring people with these certifications, who then add unexpected value within an organization, that's when this whole thing changes. And it, 
it will change much faster than people anticipate once that starts to happen. Because at the end of the day, as you all know, it's not about that piece of paper, it's about whether or not these people are adding value. And you can add value in so many different ways that go above and beyond the degree that you picked up. So if we can get that flywheel spinning where organizations see the value in people who've gained uh, the requisite skills and the certifications and, and how these are uh, kind of unpolished gems and people hadn't seen uh, these capabilities and this kind of talent out there at scale, uh, that's when demand's gonna pick up and then you're gonna start to see more people taking that coursework and so forth and so on. Where it starts to become even more fundamental is when universities, vocational training facilities, junior colleges, and even high schools start to pick up on the data. The data that we and other companies can increasingly make available so that you can see where the skills gaps are widest. You can see in any given locality anywhere in the world where the fastest growing jobs are, the skills required to obtain those jobs, the aggregate skills of your workforce within that locality, the size of that gap, and then you can imagine a world where learning organizations are able to leverage data to create just-in-time curriculums, where they are formulating the syllabus, they are formulating the learning materials in real time. Once again, we touched on this earlier, for the jobs that are and will be and not just the jobs that once were, and there's no reason that can't start to materially change not only what courses learning development facilities are providing and learning and development teams are providing, but that universities are focused on, and even high schools are focused on preparing those students for the skills that they're gonna need. So it's incredibly exciting what's gonna be possible, and it's gonna take some time to get there. But once the bricks and the wall start to come down, I think that wall is gonna tumble faster than anyone can anticipate. You've got young daughters. Can you see a point where they don't go to college, they take these courses? Would you, would you advise them to do that? I would advise my daughters to do the things that make them happy and that they want to pursue. And to the extent they are fortunate enough to know what those things are, if college is the best way to prepare for that, wonderful. And if there's other alternative means to prepare for that, more power to my daughters. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.